Hello and welcome to Conversations with the National Council on Disability. In this, our inaugural edition, we'll speak with NCD Chair Clyde Terry about the importance of a story, what's even better than finding a job, and for him, how it all began with the Bearded Men of New Hampshire. Who are the Bearded Men of New Hampshire? NCD Chair Clyde Terry explains. I was working for the Developmental Disabilities Council. A gentleman, Larry Robinson, who was the director of the Independent Living Center in the state, and Lee Persley, who was an attorney for the Disability Rights Center. We came together in the case of Mr. Robinson. He couldn't get in, into a polling place unless a police officer came outside to get a smoke. For myself and blind, I could never get a ballot that I could use privately and independently. I always had to rely on someone else. And Lee was an advocate at heart. We all happen to have beards. We first tried to change the law in New Hampshire and were told, well, there's not much we can do here. You'll have to go to Washington. And amazingly, what we found is when we talked to folks with disabilities here in the Beltway, is that everybody had a story or knew someone else that had a story of problems with voting. We eventually got a small bill introduced in the Senate. The voting franchise became important and part of the national landscape. Sort of like Mr. Smith goes to Washington, we tried to make a difference, and at the end of the day, I think we have. A real life example of how everything improves, how we're all stronger when we're able to come together. That's right. We, we don't do well when we fragment ourselves and segment ourselves. We're stronger when we recognize that we all have a joint interest in supporting this disability community as a whole. What are the milestones in terms of the work that NCD has done that you feel are significant and really inform the work that we're doing today? Still, landmark piece of work is the first versions of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The idea that persons with disabilities shall not be discriminated against in all aspects of American life. I mean, that clearly is a touchstone and landmark. But I'm sure back then, when folks at the council started this conversation, there were those that said, oh no, we couldn't be done, that's impossible, because people with disabilities, for whatever reason, sh you know, should not have the same rights as everyone else, or we, we have to make exceptions. And I'm sure that was the conversation at the time. But here we are 25 years later, and sometimes we still hear some of those voices. For example, the council did a report on subminimum wage. The council's view is, it's not so much to look at today, let's look at tomorrow. We don't know what technology, healthcare, education is going to do for all our citizens, including folks with disabilities. So we can't have a public policy that discriminates. We have to have a public policy that includes. So for those who may not be in the disability community or might not know what subminimum wage is, they'll probably be shocked to even know that such a thing exists. Just give people a little overview. In the 30s, you know, Congress, I'm sure, had the best intentions in mind. And given this, the nature of labor at the time, perhaps, that they should not get the same wage as people without disabilities. But that was the 30s. We are 50, 60, 70 years past that time. Advances in technology, attitudes have changed, health care's changed, education's changed. We invest in education for all children with a disability. Why do we still have a public policy on the books that says they could receive only a dollar an hour or less? And so just as we're not driving around in Model Ts anymore, policy marches on. And this is one of those areas that perhaps the policy hasn't caught up with the ways that people are thinking or what even the expectations of disabled people are as we embark on 2016. That's right. I grew up at a time pre-ADA, pre-IDEA, pre-any legislation that protects the rights of kids with disabilities. To get up to go see the blackboard, I would stand up and the teacher would say to me, well, you can look at it, but don't get in the way of those students because they need to read it. Well, I needed to read it too, but my rights, my interest in having an education was not the same as everybody else. I was told on any number of times that I'll never finish school, that there's a shoe factory in town, you should probably just go work there now, that you're taking up space in school. That was the attitude in the 50s. We've changed since then. And so this law, which still has old attitudes about the possibilities for folks with disabilities, needs to change too. I'm proud that the council 
has voted over time to end that practice as a matter of policy. MCD needs to make sure that we continue to look around the corner to make sure we can eliminate any of the other artificial barriers that prevent people from being as successful as they want to be. It's important that we learn from history and make sure that people with disabilities are not scapegoats for other problems. And what do you mean by that? The perception that folks with mental illness are a threat to our society. It's not demonize the individual. The response to that is to make sure that we have an adequate mental health system adequately funded so that people can get the support they need so that they can indeed be the best that they choose to be so that they can be contributing productive members of our society because we can't afford to waste any of the skills, talents of anybody. We need to be able to step back and say the solution here is a systemic solution of adequate support for folks that have different types of mental health, psychiatric disabilities. There's a resistance even to the word. So then how do you bring people together to organize, to fight for their rights, to actually be that kind of uh, voting block or that constituency that politicians pay attention to? It is remarkable. I was just in a taxi here in D.C., and the taxi driver, was he was losing his sight, and he said, one of the most amazing things about America is that you are accepting, that you are working to find ways to include people who are blind, include that person in the wheelchair that I just left on the sidewalk. But the fact of the matter is that America is a place where we're trying to find ways to make sure everyone can participate, and his country doesn't do that, and so he was just proud to be here. And I think this community needs to be proud that that's what we stand for, and that's what we're trying to achieve. It is a community that is broader, incorporates more, if not everyone, at some point in time in their lives. So I would resist saying that this is just the disability agenda. It has to be America's agenda. And one of the ways NCD has always tried to make sure that America's agenda is NCD's agenda is by requesting public comment at our meetings. How does public comment inform NCD's work? The voting issue never would have come to the attention to anyone here if, in fact, the three bearded men didn't continuously come down for weeks on end, putting the issue in front. The only way to understand what are people really thinking, what are they feeling, is to get out of D.C. periodically and hear from people. What are people saying? What do you see as the next big issue on the horizon for NCD and for the disabled community? In our society, money is power, and we need to be in a place where we are viewed as an economic engine just like any other group. And one way to get there is to encourage the disability community to stop arguing about getting into the coffee shop. It's about time they own it. And we need to have government policies that support such changes so that folks with disabilities can acquire wealth and can acquire assets so that they can flex some economic muscle in the marketplace. We have a strong independent living program across the country, but the best definition to independent living is a paycheck and money in the bank. How can a federal agency like NCD help disabled Americans achieve those goals? The beauty of NCD, the National Council on Disability, is that it is cross-disability in that it has the fortune to sort of look around the corner in terms of what's coming next. What are the barriers that people are experiencing today and think about how can we address them in a policy framework so that those barriers could be eliminated for generations to come. Thank you, Clyde Terry, for joining us on this, the first edition of Conversations with the National Council on Disability. If you'd like to find out more about the work that we do, please go to our website, ncd.gov. Until next time, I'm your host, Lawrence Carter-Long. <laughs>